everybody, and thank you for coming back uh, for our next session. Um, we are pleased to have another one of our uh, emerging BIPOC scholars uh, here today, uh, Mr. Omar Dizier. Uh, Omar uh, is, uh, uh, his native country is Rwanda. Omar has worked uh, in civil society, where he's f uh, focused on uh, memorization process in post-genocide Rwanda, peace building, youth strategies, empowerment, engagement, as well as the development of strategic actions that respond to genocide prevention, peace building, and socioeconomic needs. We're so glad to have uh, Omar here with us today. Uh, Omar, would you like to take it away? Thank you very much. Uh, is, I was a we were planning this session. Uh, I had someone speaking in Rwanda there, and uh, he was greeting me like Muraho, which means how are you uh, in my in native language. And I was telling him uh, that we now we are two Rwandans in the room. So I'm coming from Rwanda, uh, which is a, a small country uh, which is located in East Africa. It's in Africa of. Um, all great rigs regions of eastern east of Africa. Uh, so as Morris presented me, uh, my name is Omar Ndizeye. Ndizeye. So I realized that uh, Ndizeye complicated a lot of Americans. Uh, you can call me Dizeye, Dizeye, Dizeye. Whatever comes to you, easy. Just call me like that. But my other name is also Omar. Uh, and DZ means I hope. Uh, so I hope today conversation is going to be uh, fruitful and going to be peaceful because uh, there is a word peace uh, in my presentation today, which is a life uh, of justice through peace building. I would like to start uh, by thanking Morris, uh, Willie, and you know the entire uh, Sunny Duchess College family uh, that organized this conference today and invite, invite us all speak, to speak about the life of justice through peace building. Um, Morris and I had a lot of exchange uh, for me to arrive here today. And, and I want also to thank everyone who is here um, for this exchange because there couldn't be an exchange without you, uh, without both of us. Uh, again, I mentioned my name uh, as I was introduced. I was born uh, in the southeast of Rwanda, um, a country that is located in Eastern Africa. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm a genocide survivor. Uh, and currently, I'm doing studies on genocide um, prevention and research on the memorization process of the 1994 genocide against Tutsi in Rwanda, as uh, Morris mentioned. As a survivor of the genocide, uh, I have always asked myself uh, why survivors' stories. Sometimes are not part of the bigger narratives, uh, conversation and a debate about the genocide. And this goes across, across all genocide. It's not only genocide against Tutsi in Rwanda. Uh, because genocide is, is discussed in intellectual areas, uh, I've always asked, I was always interested to hear survivors' stories. In 2014, uh, when I met Professor Stephanie Wolf from Weber State University uh, in Utah during my times, uh, she was bringing American students to Rwanda, as my friend visited Rwanda. Uh, uh, that time, uh, you know, the students were in Rwanda to, to in the peace building uh, studies, but also visiting memorials. So. When I met Professor Stephanie then, I proposed uh, her that we write an article together about the Nyamata, uh, Nyamata Genocide Memorial. Nyamata Memorial is a former Catholic parish uh, where I have survived uh, after my father, my young brother, and around 10,000 Tutsis were massacred in the two days massacre that happened uh, uh, on 15, April 15th and 16th in 1994. 
Oh, before that was before our liberation uh, uh, by the Rwandan Patriotic Front Armed Forces on May 13th, uh, 1994. That's when the uh, Bugesera region, which, where, which is the region where I was born, that was when it was liberated. So the Rwandan Patriotic Front is the current ruling party in Rwanda. So I have lived in the forest before that liberation. I have lived in the forest for a period of one, one month. Uh, the forest and the bushes surrounding Nyamata city, uh, Nyamata town. So I must say that the loss cruelly to torture and a human level of dehumanization I have I witnessed at this young age, at the time I was 10 years old, was a reason for my participation in this research because um, I was interested in the stories and traces of genocide extermination stages in Rwanda. So this is a church uh, where I was born. I mean, where I, I survived. Uh, when you look at uh, when you look at uh, when you look at the, this gate, that's where I was with uh, my father and my young brother before they were killed. So uh, this is a light after the genocide. The church was changed. Now it's a memorial. There were a lot of uh, corpses here, uh, uh, you know, after that day, and there are a lot of uh, corpses inside. You can imagine ten thousand who are killed inside the church, um, the surrounding Sunday school and the, and the, and the uh, monastery. So I would like to say that uh, the specific, I mean, the, this experience, uh, my experience uh, uh, also, you know, working on uh, this research on memorials was also informed by my work of working with survivors after I graduated from university. Again, as Morris mentioned, I also worked in civil society organizations where I then I was able to meet non-survivors communities. Uh, in Rwanda, for those who don't know Rwanda, after the genocide, the society is composed by uh, the former perpetrators. Uh, for those who read about Rwanda, you know that Gachacha uh, mentioned that around 1.0 million uh, uh, of Hutu people participated in the genocide. And uh, not all of them are in the prison now because we have uh, 8,000. So there are also returnees. Uh, these are people, mostly Tutsis, who are, uh, who are li in living in the surrounding countries uh, in the exile 30 years. So, and then survivors. But also, when we talk about the, the Hutu community, there are also some of, of them who participate in rescuing Tutsis. So each of this particular of the society has a meaning in the society. So when I was working with civil society, uh, with survivor civil society, I developed the Humuran Huliwe Nyene program, which means don't worry, you are not alone. This innovative program continues to enable survivors in Rwanda to have access to the first aid psychologic, uh, psycho psychotherapy. Uh, uh, you can see here uh, during the commemoration where young people who are trained in the first aid are helping. So this uh, 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 program that I innovated uh, when I was uh, still working with survivors organization. It's still there, it's still working with, uh, it's still run by uh, a survivors student organization and but also uh, different survivors organization are now using part of it. <coughs> In this journey where I, I also worked, as I mentioned, with a civil society then, I have learned that the story or the message that people have, who have suffered from atrocities, the story they share, most of the time is related to what psychology, psychology experts call here and now. Therefore, I have understood that giving justice to the genocide survivors, memory requires time, active reasoning, a safe space setting, and appropriate interpretation. Uh, when our field research started, then, uh, as I mentioned, I worked, I'm working with uh, Professor Stephanie, uh, when it started in 2016, the former Rwanda National Commission in Charge of Genocide Memory, CNLJ, it's a French acronym, gave us a list of 265 genocide memorials across the country. Uh, these are memorials and the graveyards uh, where victims of the genocide have been buried in mass graves. Not only I discovered that at this time the whole of the genocide, 
uh, this, uh, what this number of memorials represented. But I also thought about the lost stories on the hills, marshes, rivers, and lakes of Rwanda, where in the Hutu militias, uh, who were killing at the time, wiped out entire families. From that time, we, uh, from that time, we increased our research team. I was with Stephanie when we started. So to become four members of a research team, uh, of course, we are coordinated by Professor Stephan, as I mentioned. But from 2000, that was from 2009, you know, from 2016 when our research started to 2019, uh, which our field uh, study took, the, time, the timeline. Uh, only Stephanie uh, and I and the Dr. Anna Marie from Pretoria University were the field, uh, were part of the field, the uh, field the team. Even though we are four, but three of us uh, were able to go to field. Uh, that time, we visited 124 genocide memorials. We were able to interview 184 uh, genocide survivors, experts, and memorial actors in Rwanda and in America because they are part of, and outside of Rwanda, because they are also part of experts who worked on as I was telling my friend, the Chigali Genocide Memorial, for example, which was built by the two Smiths. One of Smiths is, for those who know, the uh, U.S. Shaw Foundation, he used to be one of the CEO there. As we were interviewing, if, uh, you know, we were visiting memorials after memorial and interviewing the survivors, I noticed a strong attachment that survivors attributed to the places where their beloved ones were slaughtered. In some cases, nothing uh, was at, that, at those places to mark the tragic and the traumatic memories that trigger uh, the, you know, the trauma, uh, but also the memory uh, among the survivors community. Although the order uh, uh, for all government controlled to, uh, the internet you know, during the genocide was to exterminate Tutsis and leave none to tell their stories, Survivors also lived this, uh, that's part of what we discovered in our research, that survivors also lived this experience differently. Uh, one of the survivors we interviewed, uh, she's, her name is Speciose Kanyabugoyi. Uh, she survived the massacre of Nyanza uh, in Ichigari city today, Nyanza Hill, uh, um, after losing her husband. Uh, you know, she told us that, uh, that was in your French. C'est comme si chacun l'escapé, c'est une bibliothèque. En fait, chacun l'escapé, il a son histoire, which, which could be translated. It's like every survivor is actually a library. In fact, every survivor got his or her personal story. The reason why I'm mentioning uh, 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 her, her title is for you to understand that even if, by visiting all those uh, 124 genocide memorials, we were, we were finding a lot of uniqueness. Most of the time, stories that are not a part of mainstream discussion uh, about genocide against Tutsi in Rwanda. As you know, today there is a very big debate by those who say that what happened in Rwanda is genocide against Tutsi, and those who say that it's a Rwandan genocide. Hopefully from this discussion, we can also talk on that. You know, after observing, after observing uh, the attachment that survivors uh, had to the killing site, uh, uh, you know, as, as you may know, a French uh, historian, I, uh, uh, Pierre Nola, she called some of these killing sites, or killing sites, she also called them sites of memory. Uh, in the French, lien de mémoire. I decided uh, at the end of, towards the end of our work, uh, to also uh, include a site of uh, our research on memorials to start searching on sites of memory. So this is a map I developed. Uh, uh, it's a map of Rwanda, but all these signs you are seeing on the map are uh, sites where Tutsis were killed during the genocide. It includes, as you can see, 127 churches, uh, 207 uh, government offices, health facilities, military barracks, and, uh, and, the, and the others. Others, I mean hills, roadblocks, uh, rivers, because the rivers were also part of the killing uh, sites in Rwanda. 
but this map, I have to precise that this map represents uh, 265 genocide, um, you know, killing sites, all sites of memory, as Nora calls them, from all parts of Rwanda. It doesn't include roadblocks, uh, 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 wrecks, rivers, as I mentioned, and the other unknown sites. During our research, uh, we, uh, from the testimonies, we, 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 we learned that uh, roadblocks, uh, the, the, the principle of Vinhel Hamlet, the order they had, was, was to set a roadblock at each junction of the road. Of course, with the development of the country, uh, the increase of population, some of the street structure have been changed, which, which also means the loss of those uh, stories and those, those, uh, uh, those sites. Well, this map demonstrates the extent to which genocide devastated Rwanda. It also shows that the research on genocide against Tutsi in Rwanda has unexplored, undocumented sites of memory, as each of them means thousands of stories. Remember uh, what uh, uh, Speciosa mentioned. Throughout our interviews with survivors, our visit to the genocide memorials, monuments, and the sites of memory, I have understood that genocide is beyond the killing and extermination. The, uh, extermination and the destruction of a victim's property. It's, it's also the unimagined level of cruelty that sometimes sites of memory represent. It's about thousands of stories lost sometimes. Uh, or in the silence of survivors. For those who have read about Holocaust, you know that most of the Holocaust survivors started to share their stories after 20 years. So in that silence, there are a lot of memories, there are a lot of, fog, there are a lot of parts of memory that have been lost. In the words of Speciosa Kanyabugoyi, the survivor I mentioned from Kichikiro, in Yapa de Mon, c'est un crime. Il n'y a pas de mots pour décrire le génocide. C'est un crime qu'on ne peut pas décrire, which means uh, there are no words. Uh, there, it means that we don't have the words to tell the story. We try in every, uh, she, she added that we try in every language, even French, Kinyarwanda, and English, I don't know, she said. Any language we can use, we don't have the words to tell the story. We only try but there weren't exact words to describe genocide, she said. Then, if survivors like Speciosa don't have exact words to explain the pain they have suffered during the genocide, therefore how many times they do the stories become misinterpreted, distorted or lost through translation? As you can see on, on the PowerPoint, this is a, a photo I took uh, in the north of Rwanda, uh, in the north of Rwanda, in the west, in the district called the Gakenye district. So this was a used, this used to be government offices where the, 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 the killers killed uh, the victims and then uh, cut their hands and then used their hands in the blood to mark this fingerprint on the wall. So the time we visited, these fingerprints were still alive, were still existing. Surprisingly, the ICC logo has, uh, uh, of the victims have hands. I think I will give them the, the, the Leo photo, the exact fingerprint of people who were killed one, one day, I guess. Our research discovered a strong influence, I mean, uh, so, so you can see this. But also our research discovered a strong influence, you know, these are part of the things we discovered in our research. The cruelty, the level of cruelty, which is not discussed, because most of the time in the debates about genocide, people discuss other stages. Remember, uh, 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 Gregory Stanton mentioned 10 stages. But when you see most of the conversation about genocide al around other, gen other, other stages, other than extermination, I, I must precise that my presentation is about the extermination stage of genocide against Tutsi in Rwanda. So in our research, we discovered the strong influence of Rwandan culture, mourning rituals, the Kinyarwanda language, a language which is used in Rwanda, and some borrowing uh, of practices from the Holocaust memorization uh, uh, in the morning and the remembrance of the victims killed during the genocide against the in Rwanda. The reason being because ex uh, um, Holocaust is, 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 
is a, is a well documented and there are a lot of uh, uh, scholars and experts about the memory. So survivors, whenever they lost answers to, uh, the, whenever the Rwandan culture was not responding to this horrific memory, they were borrowing in different uh, practices, practices from other, 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 other mass atrocities uh, pre uh, memorization. So they had they invited uh, Armenian uh, survivors and the other survi Holocaust survivors and the others just to learn, for example, how do we bury people who are killed in the mass in the mass in the church? Because the Rwandan culture culturally, well, it's 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 a taboo to bury two people in the same grave. Yet, as I mentioned, Nyamata, Nyamata Church, there is now ten thousand in one mass grave. How do we then respond to that? So that these questions like, and uh, you know, puzzling questions like this, that, that's why some survivors went to borrow some of those practices of the people who experienced uh, this horrific uh, uh, genocide, mass atrocities in the past. Um, as I conclude this presentation, because I'm also expecting some conversation, uh, two ways conversation uh, about this history, I'm assuming there are a row of questions. Um, uh, I would like to say that based on our research and in my experience of working in civil society in Rwanda, in peace building and social healing, uh, we, we should understand that memory has an important place in both justice and the build, peace building in a, you know, for us to build a society that is socially empower the vulnerable people. We must understand the, the memory in every society, the memory of the past. Until we discuss about the memory, we can never, I mean, from our point of view, from our perspective, it's difficult to address uh, the issues related to the vulnerables in the society. To achieve this, we should understand that the central role of culture in a society to ensure that the here and the now, here and the now, what, what these people are telling, if someone is talking about, is sharing a story, if someone is sharing a concern, sometimes it's beyond the message he, he or she is sharing. Sometimes this person, this person don't have a words to exactly explain what's happened, as special as I mentioned. Therefore, we need to understand the central role of culture. How, how Americans tell stories, it's different from how Rwandans tell the stories. In this, when we were interviewing the survivors, they were, they were telling us, do you want me to start in 1963? Because they also had a pogrom of Tutsis in that time. Or you want me to start exactly 1994? When here in America I have learned that we should start with a personal story. Here, when in America, pizza it means a lot of things. You know, when you want to people to attend, you, see, you, you organize a pizza party and they, they talk. In Rwanda, then you bring food in a in talk about genocide, then that means uh, you have looked down people. That's why I'm insisting that we should also give culture a central role in the conversation uh, within a society if we are addressing the socially uh, vulnerable people in a society. How, do the, how does a society teach its own people to tell a story? Because at the end, the story is, is a medicine. This will enable survivors of mass atrocities to heal and they become members of a society which will enable the reparation of empathy and the trust and the collective sense of belonging. Sometimes uh, people talk about this, the collective sense of belonging. We are this, we are, we are in one country. Yet what we need to repair first is empathy and the trust. So we can only uh, repair empathy and the trust according to my experience uh, and uh, our research through storytelling, through setting dialogues, setting dialogue place where people tell stories and they are not judged. So that, so for them to be able to trust members of the society who sometimes have uh, oppressed them. 
In the words of the late uh, Rwandan psychiatric professor Nasson Munyandamutsa, the misfortune is having no one to listen to you while the world is filled with people. So here you can see Mr. Sero Genocide Memorial. Mr. Sero Genocide Memorial, it had, there is a, there is a, there is a, a spears. Uh, these spears and the stone inside, they, it means it's one of the, uh, the most known resistance uh, where Tutsi resisted to uh, the government military attack and in Hirame from three parts of Rwanda, Jikongoro, Changugu, uh, and Chibuye. And the free military barracks, Chichangugu military barracks, and the uh, Chibuye military barracks, and the Jisen military barracks. It's located in the West. It said that 50,000 people perished on this hill. So, but of course, uh, through the technique of Kivanga developed by one of uh, uh, the leader of the resistance who died in, the, in those uh, three days attacks, uh, uh, s there are some survivors who survived by resisting using spears and, uh, and the stone. If you go to Kigali Genocide Memorial, which was developed by um, Nan Rwandan, and you go to Bisesero, then you understand also that the culture means a lot in the memory. That's why Vesdast brought spears and stone, which means a lot in Rwandan culture and, the, and in that resistance. But when you go to Chigari Genocide Memorial, you also find a lot of ways, Western way of telling a story, which is writing. That, that means if we also need to ma uh, memorize in the context of Rwanda, we need to match both. That means Western uh, knowledge about telling a story, but also Rwandan way of telling a story to be able to capture what happens uh, in that space. Therefore, uh, I'm concluding uh, because I mentioned the, about the role of listening and the role of storytelling and the space, safe space where people tell stories and not judged. Let's all be good listeners to, to those who, whose hearts are burdened, are burdened by the memories of the past as we build a just and peaceful society because that is in reality a true sense of justice. Thank you very much.